sea mine warfare. Warfare where enemies seldom meet and battle is rarely joined. But where death and destruction always mark the field. Where the mighty fleets fight their battles, the little minecraft have already been to do their dull and deadly duty for which there is no glory. Where the fighting fleets sail to victory, there are seas of glory. But where the little ships go, there is only a most dangerous sea. Sea mines have been employed at naval warfare for more than 350 years. Until about 1880, they were known as torpedoes. Some eight beer kegs filled with gunpowder brought about an historic reaction from Admiral Farragut when he said, damn the torpedoes, full speed ahead. Farragut won the battles of Mobile Bay, but after the South had surrendered, he had to go in and sweep up their mines. As the first minesweeping officer of the Navy, he learned something about mine warfare. Mines never surrender. Mines are usually classified by their position in the sea, either moored or bottom. But they are also referenced by their method of actuation which can be contact with the ship or by the ship's influence in terms of sound, pressure, or magnetism. Modern sea mine laying is carried out most often from aircraft, sometimes from submarines, and from surface craft. Aircraft can replenish minefields so that the minefield presents a constant threat to the enemy. Simple contact mines were the basic weapon of mine warfare until World War II. A large explosive charge encased in a suitable container was moored to the seafloor by an anchor so that the mine was positioned beneath the surface some 10 or 20 feet. Several triggering horns protruded from the shell. If a passing ship made contact with one of these horns, the firing circuit was closed and This same principle is still in use today in the moored, contact type of mine. In clearing a contact minefield, each mine's mooring cable is cut by armed sweep wires towed from the minesweeper's stern. During sweeping operations, depressors, otters, and floats control the sweep wire with cutting gear attached. Otters force the cutting wire to extend outboard of the towing ship where a float pennant from the float sets the cutting depth. The float may submerge as the sweep cable takes the strain when a mine is cut. After surfacing, the mine is destroyed by gunfire from another following sweeper. During World War I, the simple contact mine was joined by mines which could be set off from the shore by an electrical circuit. World War II, still more treacherous mines were developed, types that would lie on the ocean floor and wait to be exploded by the noise of the ship, or by a reduction in water pressure caused by the ship's hull passing over, or by the effect of the ship's magnetic field as it intersects the mine's induction coil, or by combining any two or more of these triggering influences into a single mine. Magnetic influence mines were first developed by the British as early as 1917. Although it was not until the Germans commenced using aircraft to lay magnetic mines in British harbor entrances during 1939 that they became a real threat. Unlike the contact mine, magnetic mines do not have to be moored to an anchor but can be sewn freely to lie on the ocean floor. The Nazis made two mistakes when they began to use the magnetic mine in 1939. Instead of waiting until enough of them were ready so that all British ports could be mined at once, they dropped them in small numbers on only a few ports. The second mistake was inadvertent. A Luftwaffe pilot dropped one of the new magnetic mines on a mud bank of the Thames estuary instead of the harbor. 
the Royal Navy recovered it. Had larger quantities been available to permit widespread continuing use of the new mine, it might have permitted the Nazis to blockade this vital lifeline of England. The recovery of a single mine from the Thames estuary contributed greatly to Great Britain's success in countering the magnetic mine threat. And crude magnetic sweeps were developed. To counter magnetic mines, the minesweeper's gear must duplicate a ship's magnetic influence. Today, magnetic sweep gear consists of two large cables, a short leg and a long leg, played out astern from a large reel. A long leg is streamed astern for about 1,200 feet. At the end of each leg is a copper electrode. With the cable streamed astern of the sweeper, a powerful generator aboard the vessel supplies pulsed currents which pass through the water or ocean bottom between the electrodes. Another method is to pass the current through a closed loop depending upon sweep conditions. The strong magnetic field generated by the flow of current is capable of detonating magnetic mines. Acoustic influence mines are detonated by the machinery or propeller noise of a passing ship. Like the magnetic mine, it can also be planted on the sea floor. Acoustic mines use a simple hydrophone or artificial ear that is responsive to a selected sound frequency from a wide spectrum of frequencies generated by the ship's engines or propellers. When it detects such noises, its diaphragm vibrates causing the fatal switch to close. These mines are countered by towing a device called a hammer box, which makes a sound like the ship's noises as it's towed through the minefield. In the storehouse of mine warfare, the third influence type mine is the pressure mine. Here, the positive pressure wave caused by a ship's passage, followed closely by a negative pressure wave, causes the mine to fire. If a minefield is known to contain pressure mines, ships passing through the field can, by adjusting their speed in the mine region, avoid creating the correct pressure influence. To sweep pressure mines, the changing water pressure produced by passing ships must be duplicated. The toughest type of modern mine is the combination mine, one that combines magnetic acoustic or pressure magnetic or all three of the influence sensors in the same container. This type will explode only when the right combination of two or more of the disturbing forces are employed by the sweepers. To complicate matters even more, ship counters can be built into the firing circuit of nearly any type of mine. They can be preset to explode only after a given number of ships have passed. Thus, a minesweeper can sweep a channel a number of times, declare the channel swept, and still have a mine explode beneath the next passing ship. At the end of the war with Japan, the Pacific Fleet's mine forces had chalked up an impressive score. 50,000 mines had been laid. 1,054 enemy ships sunk. After five years of war, the combat ships of the fleet returned home. The sweepers remained, along with 100 Japanese sweepers, to destroy the thousands of mines laid against Japan during Operation Starvation. By March of 1946, 12,000 moored mines and 100 influence mines had been swept. Just four short years later, at the outset of hostilities in Korea, only nine sweepers could be mustered for the Incheon invasion. The reserve mine forces were home in civilian jobs. The World War II ships were scrapped or in mothballs. Around this nucleus of nine ships, the American mine force in Korea was born. Luckily, the invasion at Incheon presented no serious problem from minefields because of the tides. By timing the landing to coincide with the low tide, 
the minefield was exposed and easily destroyed by gunfire. With the success of the first invasion, General MacArthur decided upon an amphibious assault landing at Wonsan to relieve pressure on the 8th Army's supply lines and to prevent the escape of remnant North Korean forces in the area. Joint Task Force 7 ordered all minesweepers to the Wonsan area. Thus, on a chilling October 10th, nine minesweepers arrived off Wonsan. How much of a cabbage patch the communists had planted was unknown. Amphibious assaults against Okinawa had been preceded by 100 sweepers, the invasion of Normandy by 300. During the first day's sweeping off Wonsan, a 12-mile channel had been cut from the 100-fathom curve to the 30-fathom curve. 21 contact mines had been destroyed. But good luck did not hold. Late afternoon, a helicopter from the USS Worcester suddenly dipped lifted slightly and dipped again. The pilot reported, one mine ahead of minesweeper fled, another mine just beyond, another, another, and another. As the sweepers closed in from the 30 fathom curve to the beaches, overwhelming numbers of mines were encountered. Pirate and Pledge, two steel-hulled sweepers, went down. Casualties were heavy. After a shocking dispatch to Washington, conferences were held aboard the USS Missouri. How long will it take to sweep a path to the beach? Will the invasion be delayed? If so, what will be the effects of launching late? The decision is made. The limited sweepers still available must be given time to clear the invasion channel. Sweeping continued. Helicopters continued to be used at Wonsan. Their entry into the mine hunting business was brought about when a helicopter pilot took a picture of two moored mines while on a search mission for a sunken ship. Meanwhile, the ships of the invasion force waited. 50,000 troops remained aboard 250 ships. The ships steamed up and down the shore off Wonsan for days, back and forth so many times that the troops dubbed the maneuvers Operation Yo-Yo. The sweepers formed up for their last expected passage. In an hour, Wonsan Harbor would be open. Only in an hour, they were worse off than when they had started 10 days before. Wonsan Harbor was suddenly discovered to contain more mines, and no one knew what kind they were. Magnetic mines were found in large quantities. A Republic of Korea sweeper was blown to bits. Sweeping continued. On the evening of October 25th, Wonsan Harbor was finally swept clear of mines. Fifteen days had been spent on what should have been a five-day job at the most. Historically, Russia has long been noted for her interest in mines, more so perhaps than any other nation in modern times. The Crimean War, the Russo-Turkish War of 1877, and the Russo-Japanese War of 1904 all saw Russia's development of mines. And now, at this place and time, they had provided their North Korean satellite with over 4,000 mines and the officers and technicians to assist in preparing them for laying. It was an excellent opportunity to test the U.S. Navy's ability to cope with mines in the Western Pacific as of 1950 and to find out how our forces would counter the threat. The opportunity was too good to be missed. Only 225 mines were swept out of the 3,000 laid by primitive craft such as junks, sampans, and barges in a three-week period. The Marines and Army troops were finally landed on the beach 
and the assault now became an administrative exercise because the South Korean army had, in the interim, marched through Wonsan and Northland. Admiral Joy summarized, the main lesson of the Wonsan invasion is that no so-called subsidiary branch of the naval service, such as mine warfare, should ever be neglected or relegated to a minor role in the future. Wonsan taught us that we can be denied freedom of movement to an enemy objective through the intelligent use of mines by an alert foe. Sea mines have a psychological value that's immeasurable. There's something frightening when your opponent is a mindless automatic machine. It's there, you know it, and it's not going to make a mistake. But if you do, it may kill you. It's much easier to bring a nation faced with a mine blockade and the certainty of starvation to the conference table to negotiate a peaceful settlement than with any other form of warfare. A mine blockade enables the winner to triumph without killing. Enemy ships lost in a minefield have entered it by their own choice. The enemy could have kept them in port. But most important, mines do not destroy homes, schools, hospitals, or industrial facilities necessary to peacetime rehabilitation. Among the sane nations of the world, the threat of an atomic holocaust has brought about nuclear stalemate. Yet nuclear parity has not eliminated the so-called limited war, which may range from small police actions to full-scale wars employing everything except nuclear weapons. In limited warfare, the sea mine has many unique characteristics which are useful to the military planner. Once delivered, the sea mine does not require manned direction. It can wait alone, unattended, for its target. It can increase the tactical effectiveness of any delivery vehicle. For only with a waiting weapon, such as a mine, can the vehicle project its threat in many places at once. Conservation of forces, a built-in feature of sea mine warfare, makes it well suited to the needs of limited wars. Blockading of harbors and sea lanes using tactical ships is always effective, but a minefield can help reduce the number of tactical units required to maintain a blockade, and can effectively seal off the area if the ships must leave for even a few days. Or the area can be saturation mined, releasing the surface forces for duty elsewhere. Mines may also be preset to render themselves harmless, providing a safe sea lane access to our attack forces. Sea mine warfare can be used as an instrument of precisely measured military pressure. For example, a harbor can be sealed off for a predetermined period of time, simply to indicate to the enemy the effects of a blockade. If the first mining did not produce the desired results, a second effort could be started of longer duration. Or the task force commander could then impose a surface blockade or combine the two for maximum effect. Delivery agents can pick and choose their time for minefield laying to suit their own best advantage. Visibility, sonar defenses, even enemy deployment can be taken into consideration. Movement of enemy forces requires access to sea lanes which must be defended by some sort of screening forces. And even under the best of circumstances, a surface blockade of these enemy movements is easier to detect than is a minefield blockade. In the past, ships of war engaged in battle wherever and whenever they encountered each other at sea. The modern naval forces expend most of their energy in attacking from the sea rather than fighting upon it. Their efforts are usually directed at selected targets, requiring weapons which are also selected. The sea mine is such a weapon. It can be tailored to destroy only submarines or selected surface ships. For example, a fairly coarse setting on a magnetic mine would respond to a merchant ship signature, 
but it is unlikely to be detonated by small wooden fishing boats. Pressure mines can also be set to discriminate against small ships and minor surface craft as targets. Acoustic mines may be adjusted to high frequency signatures permitting passage of all ships not turbine powered but the greatest effectiveness can be obtained by merely an open announcement of the establishment of a minefield. It is a peril to all who would challenge it. Yet it is harmful only to those who do attempt to challenge it. It establishes a permanent barrier that is impenetrable from either direction, one that will remain effective in all conditions of visibility, weather, and sea. Enemy minesweepers can, of course, attack it in an effort to reduce the threat. But the minefield can be continually replenished. The oceans of the world are connected by many sea lanes and regions where effective mine barriers can be established. Narrow, shallow water straits can be mined to stop enemy ships and submarines from gaining entry into the open ocean. Barrier forces can then be deployed to establish a maximum threat to the enemy. Our destroyers can ply the seas. Killer submarines can move in. Carriers screened by the destroyers can launch their attack aircraft in search of the enemy. All join to pose a threat that will be hard to penetrate. An effective blockade has been established. With the advent of the Korean ceasefire in 1953, there came new classes of minesweepers. Non-magnetic wooden ships and iron men once more became a reality for the new fleet. The MSO is the basic minesweeper of the Navy, an ocean-going vessel that can travel to any part of the world and maintain itself on station for long periods of time. To counter the shallow water mine threat in sea mine warfare, the mine sweeping fleet must be able to move rapidly to the area of conflict. This is the Ozark, an MCS or Mine Countermeasures weapon system. She is 485 feet long. She carries 20 MSL launches for shallow water work. and two mine-sweeping helicopters, and also provides flag facilities for the Mine Countermeasures Commander. Her mine-sweeping helicopters can tow a moored sweep ahead of the MSLs, providing added safety for the sweepers during mine-sweeping operations. These 36-foot mine-sweeping launches are an outgrowth of the small boats first used so effectively for shallow water mine work in Korea. Each launch is capable of mine hunting and sweeping moored, acoustic, and magnetic mines in shallow water regions. During shallow water mine hunting and mine sweeping operations, the position of the MSLs is controlled by the MCS by the use of radar and master reference buoys. When an MSL locates a mine with its own portable detection and classification sonar, it launches a marker. EOD swimmers then move in to recover or neutralize the mine as desired. Magnetic mines can be swept by a single mine sweeping launch or in combination with another MSL. In addition, it can tow and provide power to conventional acoustic sweep devices. The MCS operates very much as a carrier in that it supports its own weapon system, the MSLs and helos. In addition to the shallow water work of the MSLs, it can also provide limited logistics support for MSOs. This artist's conception of the Navy's newest minesweeper, the MSS, or Minesweeper Special, will give the Navy its only means of sweeping pressure mines. Converted from a 441-foot Liberty hull, which is refitted with foam flotation, 
the ship is manned by a limited crew stationed in an especially protected bridge area during sweeping. Underway, the ship's hull will provide the proper pressure signature to detonate pressure mines. Today, when far-ranging nuclear submarines, missilery, and space satellites consume a great part of our development effort and planning, it is well to remember that mine warfare is as effective today as it has ever been in the past.